Hi everyone, this is Glenda Ganzon and welcome to my Human Anatomy and Physiology class. And for today's video, I'm going to be discussing the bones of the upper limb. So stay tuned. The upper limb is divided into three regions, and this consists of the arm located between the shoulder and the elbow joints, the forearm, which is between the elbow and the wrist joints, and the hand, which is located distal to the wrist. Uh, there are 30 bones in each upper limb. The humerus is the single bone of the upper arm, and the ulna, which is located medially, and the radius laterally are the paired bones of the forearm. The base of the hand contains eight bones, and each called a carpal bone, and the palm of the hand is formed by five bones, each called a metacarpal bone. The fingers and thumb contain a total of 14 bones, and each of which is a phalanx bone of the hand. The humerus is the single bone of the arm region. At its proximal end, is the head of the humerus. This is the large, round, smooth region that faces medially. The head articulates with the glenoid cavity of the scapula to form the glenoid humeral or what we call as the shoulder joint. The margin of the smooth area of the head is the anatomical neck of the humerus. Located on the lateral side of the proximal humerus is an expanded bony area called the greater tubercle. The smaller, lesser tubercle of the humerus is found on the anterior aspect of the humerus. Both of the greater and lesser tubercles serve as attachment sites of or for muscles that act across the shoulder joint. Passing between the greater and lesser tubercles is the narrow intertubercular groove or what we call as the sulcus, which is also known as the bicepital groove because it provides passage for a tendon of the biceps brachii muscle and the surgical neck is located at the base of the expanded proximal end of the humerus where it joins the narrow shaft of the humerus the surgical neck is common site of arm fractures so the deltoid tuberosity is a roughened v-shaped region located on the lateral side in the middle of the humerus shaft. As its name indicates, it is the site of attachment for the deltoid muscle. Distally, the humerus becomes flattened and the prominent bony projection on the medial side is the medial or epicondyle of the humerus. The much smaller lateral epicondyl of the humerus is found on the lateral side of the distal humerus and the roughened ridge of bone above the lateral epicondyl is the lateral supracondylar ridge and all of these areas are attached or these areas are attachment points of or for muscles that act on the forearm wrist and hand the powerful grasping muscles of the anterior forearm arise from the medial epicondyl, which is thus larger and more robust than the lateral epicondyl that gives rise to the weaker posterior forearm muscles. The distal end of the humerus has two articulation areas, which join the ulna and radius bones of the forearm to form the elbow joint. The more medial of this are or this areas is the trochlea which is a spindle or pulley shaped region which articulates with the ulna bone immediately lateral to the tro trochlea is the capital or capitulum this is a knob-like structure located on the anterior surface of the distal humerus the capitulum articulates with the radius bone of the forearm. Just above this bony areas are two small depressions. These spaces accommodate the forearm bones when the elbow is fully bent or uh, flat. Superior to the trochlea is the coronoid fossa, which receives the coronoid process of the ulna, and above the capitulum is the radial fossa, 
which receives the head of the radius when the elbow is flexed. And similarly, the posterior humerus has the olecranon fossa, which is a larger depression that receives the olecranon process of the ulna when the forearm is fully extended. The ulna is the medial bone of the forearm. It also runs parallel to the radius, which is the lateral bone of the forearm. The proximal end of the ulna resembles a crescent wrench with its large C-shaped trochlear notch. This region articulates with the trochlea of the humerus as part of the elbow joint. The inferior margin of the trochlear notch is formed by a prominent leap of bone called the coronoid process of the ulna. Just below this, on the anterior ulna is a roughened area called the ulnar tuberosity. To the lateral side and slightly inferior to the trochlear notch is a small, smooth area called the radial notch of the ulna. And this area is the site of articulation between the proximal radius and the ulna, forming the proximal radioulnar joint. The posterior and superior portion of the proximal ulna make up olecranon process which forms the bony tip of the elbow. More distal is the shaft of the ulna. The lateral side of the shaft forms a ridge called the interosseous border of the ulna. And this is the line of attachment for the interosseous membrane of the forearm that is a sheet of dense connective tissue that unites the ulna and the radius bones. The small rounded area that form the distal end is the head of the ulna. Projecting from the posterior side of the ulnar head is the styloid process of the ulna that is a short bony projection and this serves as an attachment point for the connective tissue structure that unites the distal ends of the ulna and the radius. In the anatomical position with the elbow fully extended and the palms facing forward, the arm and the forearm do not form a straight line. Instead, the forearm deviates laterally by 5 to 15 degrees from the line of the arm and this devi uh, deviation is called the carrying angle and it allows the forearm and the hand to swing freely and to carry an object without hitting the hip. So the carrying angle is larger in females to accommodate their wider pelvis. On the other hand, the radius runs parallel to the ulna on the lateral or the thumb side of the forearm. The head of the radius is a disc-shaped structure that forms the proximal end. The small depression on the surface of the head articulates with the capitulum of the humerus as part of the elbow joint, whereas the smooth outer margin of the head articulates with the radial notch of the ulna at the proximal radioulnar joint. The neck of the radius is the narrowed region immediately below the expanded head. Inferior to this point on the medial side of the radial tuberosity, an oval shape, bony uh, protuberance that serves as a muscle attachment point. The shaft of the radius is slightly curved and has a small ridge along its medial side. And this ridge forms the enterosseous border of the radius which like the similar border of the ulna and it is the line of attachment for the enterosseous membrane that unites the two forearm bones. The distal end of the radius has a smooth surface for articulation with two carpal bones to form the radiocarpal joint or wrist joint. On the medial side of the distal radius is the ulnar notch of the radius and this allows the depression articulates the head of the ulna which together form the distal radio ulnar joint. The lateral end of the radius has a pointed projection called the styloid process of the radius and this provides attachment for ligaments that support the lateral side of the wrist, uh, wrist joint. Compared to the styloid process of the ulna, the styloid process of the radius projects more distally, thereby limiting the range of movement for lateral deviations of the hand at the wrist joint. 
For the carpal bones, the wrist and base of the hand are formed by a series of eight small carpal bones. The carpal bones are arranged in two rows, forming a proximal row of four carpal bones and a distal row of four carpal bones. The bones in the proximal row running from the lateral or thumb side to the middle side are the scaphoid, um, lunate, trichotrum, and pisiform. The small rounded pisiform bone articulates with the anterior surface of the trichotrum bone and the pisiform thus projects anteriorly where it forms the bony bump that can be felt at the medial base of your hand. The distal bones or lateral to the medial are the trapezo or trapezoim or in other words uh, that means table trapezoid which is resembles to a table capitate is uh, a head shape and hamate that is like a hook bone so the hamate bone is characterized by a prominent bone extension on the anterior side called the hook of the hamate bone let me just teach you a simple mnemonic for remembering the arrangement of the carpal bones and this is so long to pinky and here comes the thumb and this mnemonic starts on the lateral side and names the proximal bones from lateral to medial and that is scaphoid lunate trichetrum and pisiform and then makes a u-turn to the name the distal bones from the medial to the lateral which are hamate, capitate, trapezoid, and trapezium. And thus it starts and finishes on the lateral side. So the carpal bones form the base of the head, and this can be seen in the radiograph of or x ray image of the hand that shows the relationship of the hand bones to the skin creases of the hand. And within the carpal bones, uh, the four proximal bones are united to each other by ligaments to form a unit. Only three of these bones, which are the scaphoid, lunate, and trichetrum, contribute to the radiocarpal joint. The scaphoid and the lunate bones articulate directly with the distal end of the radius, whereas the trichotrum bone articulates with the fibrocartilaginous pod that expands the radius and styloid process of the ulna. The distal end of the ulna does, does not directly articulate with any of the carpal bones. So the four distal carpal bones are also held together as a group by ligaments and the proximal and distal rows of carpal bones articulate with each other to form the middle or the mid carpal joint. Together, the radiocarpal and the mid carpal joints are the responsible for all movements of the hand and wrist. And the distal carpal bones also articulate with the metacarpal bones of the hand. In the articulated hand, the carpal bones form a U-shaped grouping. A strong ligament called the flexor retina column spans the top of this U-shaped area to maintain this grouping of the carpal bones. The flexor retina column is attached laterally to the trapezoid and scaphoid bones and medially to the hamate and pisiform bones. Together, the carpal bones and the flexor retina column form the passageway called the carpal tunnel with the carpal bones forming the walls and floor and the flexor retina column forming the roof of this space. The tendons of nine muscles of the anterior forearm and an important nerve pass through this narrow tunnel to enter the hand. Overuse of the muscle tendons of wrist injury or wrist injury can produce inflammation and swelling within this space. So these procedures or, or this produces compression of the nerve resulting in the carpal tunnel syndrome which is characterized by pain or numbness and muscle weakness in those areas of the hand supplied by this nerve.
In addition, the palm of the hand contains five elongated metacarpal bones, and these bones lie between the carpal bones of the wrist and the bone of the fingers and thumb. The proximal end of each metacarpal bone articulates with one of the distal carpal bones, and each of these articulations is a carpometacarpal joint. The expanded distal end of each metacarpal bone articulates at the metacarpo or metacarpophalangeal joint with the proximal phalanx bone of the thumb or one of the fingers. The distal end also forms the knuckles of the hand at the base of the fingers. The metacarpal bones are numbered 1 to 5 beginning at the thumb. So the first metacarpal bone at the base of the thumb is separated from the other metacarpal bones and this allows it a freedom of motion that is independent of the other metacarpal bones which is very, or, or which is very important for thumb mobility and the remaining metacarpal bones are united together to form the palm of the hand. The second and third metacarpal bones are firmly anchored in the place and are immobile. However, the fourth and fifth metacarpal bones have limited anterior-posterior mobility, which is a motion that is greater for the fifth bone. And this mobility is important during power gripping with the hand and the anterior movement of these bones, particularly with the fifth metacarpal bone, increases the strength of contact for the medial hand during gripping actions. For the phalanx bones, the fingers and thumb contains 14 bones and each of which is called the phalanx or named after the ancient Greek phalanx which is a rectangular block soldiers. So the thumb which is pollex is digit number one and has two phalanges a proximal phalanx and a distal phalanx bone. Digits 2, which is the index finger through 5, which is the little finger, have three phalanges each, and that is called the proximal, middle, and the distal phalanx bones. An interphalangeal joint is one of the articulation between adjacent phal phalanges of the digits. And that ends my discussion about the bones of the upper limb of the skeletal system. If you have any question, please write it into the comment section down below and I'll be glad to answer them all. And if you're still not subscribed to my channel, please do consider subscribing. Also hit the notification bell so that you'll be updated with my new videos. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and share. So until my next video, thank you everyone for watching. Bye!